Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fishing with Ashley. If you're new to these webinars, my name is Ashley, and I'm the Field Application Specialist with Empire Genomics. On today's episode of Fishing with Ashley, we're going to dive into the protocol for setting up interphase fish from blood and bone marrow samples. This webinar will cover everything from fixation of blood and bone marrow to troubleshooting for fish for blood and bone marrow samples. So without further ado, let's jump into the webinar. So I wanna start with some basics and benefits of interphase fish and getting real basic here into basically cell biology. I want us to remember that interphase is a period in the cell cycle where cells are not dividing and the nucle nucleus is metabolically active. Interphase fish can be done with peripheral blood and bone marrow. So this is beneficial in comparison to metaphase fish. We know that it's pretty much easier to acquire metaphases from bone marrow. So that is the preferred specimen type with metaphase fish or cytogenetics and karyotyping. But when it comes to interphase fish, you can do this testing with peripheral blood or bone marrow with great success. Interphase fish requires a short-term pellet making process, allowing for cells to undergo fish testing within a day, while metaphase fish and cytogenetics requires a culture period. So this is a really big one for clinical laboratories. Interphase fish can really allow for stat testing and really quick turnaround times. You don't have to culture any kind of blood or bone marrow for metaphases. So you basically can get a peripheral blood or bone marrow sample into the lab, create your pellet within the day and get it fishing overnight to look at the results the next day. Um, you can even shorten this time by using buffers such as swift fish, which will drastically shorten your hybridization period. Culturing for metaphase fish requires the use of only heparinized blood and bone marrow samples, while interphase fish allows for both heparinized or EDTA samples. So this is a biggie as well in the sense that we're really getting the idea that with interphase fish here, you can use a wider variety of samples. With blood and bone marrow, in a cytogenetics lab or looking at metaphase fish again, uh, EDTA is kind of known as like a toxic substance for cells and for culturing. So they really prefer um, green top or heparinized blood when culturing. So with interphase fish though, because you don't have to do that culturing, you can utilize both heparinized or EDTA samples. So we're going to move on to looking at just the basic protocol breakdown of blood and bone marrow fixation and fish protocol. So starting with blood and bone marrow fixation, the first step is swelling the cells, which is just swelling the cells for optimal viewing and imaging. You fix the cells, which is basically a method of preserving the cells for study. And then you drop the cells onto slides, basically to allow yourself to probe the slides and view them under the scope. Now, in between this dropping the cells and the full fish protocol, there is an optional step. I did not include it in this breakdown because it's optional, but there will be a slide on it coming up in this presentation, and that is baking the slides. So again, that's not here, but there will be a slide that touches on that. So moving on to fish protocol, the first step, of course, is denaturation and hybridization which is an automatic or manual process of incorporating the probe into the DNA. You have wash, which is basically a removal of excess fluorescent probe and debris from the slides. And you have counter stain and viewing, which is staining the slides to allow for optimal viewing under the scope. So we're moving on to differences between blood and bone marrow. Again, this is kind of just basic um, biology type of stuff, but I really want us to understand this protocol and why we do certain things in this protocol. So with whole blood, it consists of red blood cells, plasma, and the buffy coat, white blood cells, and which is white blood cells and platelets, and peripheral blood does not typically have spontaneously dividing cells, meaning that metaphases can only be acquired if chemically induced and cultured. Now, bone marrow is part of the lymphatic system and its function is to produce blood cells, meaning that the blast concentration is high and there are spontaneously dividing cells. It is possible to yield metaphases without culturing blood and bone marrow due to cell division. So basically the takeaway here and understanding the composition of both of them 
is that you just need to know that it's important to adjust concentrations of blood and bone marrow used for harvesting, as the composition of these samples is different. Bone marrow tends to yield larger cell pellets, so it's typical to use less of the sample when harvesting. Peripheral blood tends to yield a smaller pellet, thus it's typical to utilize more of it when harvesting. So again, just the takeaway is that for bone marrow, you can use less of it, and it's important to consider that because from a technician's eye, these specimens that we're getting into labs are irreplaceable patient specimen, and I feel like that's the way that everybody should think about it. Um, this blood and bone marrow has been taken from somebody's body and is being used for testing, and we want to utilize the least amount of that while still getting optimal results from testing. So yielding the least amount of that will preserve some blood or bone marrow for further testing in different departments or for testing in the future. I know you can only really hold on to it for so long, but um, it's just good practice in case something happens to their pellet along the way to save as much of it as you can in case you need additional testing. So I've also included a lim little image here to the left of a peripheral blood component breakdown, and you can see as you let it settle or if you were to spin it down, you would have your plasma on top, your red blood cells would be at the bottom, and there would be just a little layer in between called your buffy coat. You can usually, it's like a milky consistency, and that is your white blood cells and platelets. So now we're going on to the first step of the entire blood and bone marrow fish protocol, and that's aliquoting your sample. So again, tying in the last slide, we know that we might need to use a little bit more peripheral blood to get a more decent pellet from it. So you utilize one mil of peripheral blood and add that to the 15 mil conical tube. Now with bone marrow, because it does yield a larger pellet, you can use half a mil of that and add that to the 15 mil conical tube. So again, first step in this whole process, we've got the sample in the lab. Now we're going to add either a mil of peripheral blood or half a mil of bone marrow to your 15 mil conical tube, to which we move on to the next step. And that is swelling the cells with hypotonic. So basically cell membranes are semi-permeable and water moves slowly into or out of the cell by, via osmosis, which equalizes the concentration on both sides of the membrane. So hypotonic solution works by making the concentration outside of the cell lower than that of the inside of the cell, so the cell will therefore absorb water and swell. So three major considerations to think about when going into the hypotonic step is one, your solution composition. You wanna be sure that you're using 0.075 molarity KCL, and you're gonna add 10 mils of that solution to the 15 mil conical tube with your sample inside and gently invert it to mix it. You then want to ensure that your temperature is proper. You wanna be sure that you're warming the hypotonic solution to 37 degrees before you even add it to your conical tubes. So typically when you get in the lab before you start the whole protocol, you would have some hypotonic warming in an incubator so that it's up to that appropriate temperature. And then um, also once you add that 10 mils of the 37 degree hypotonic, you want to continue to incubate the samples for the duration of the exposure of the hypotonic. And then finally, you have your time, and this is very crucial, and I'll explain more with the image to the right. You should spend no more than 10 to 25 minutes in hypotonic. So looking at the image to the right here, you have four different pictures. The first one, the cell spent three minutes in hypotonic, and you can see that there's really no change there under the scope. Image B depicts 10 minutes worth of hypotonic, and you can see this cell has grown, like almost doubled in size, and the membrane is still intact, which is very important. You don't want to ruin your cells. So that's a really beautiful image there of a nice swelled cell. It's gonna make it easier for you to view um, in the end process of fish. And then images C and D, um, right away you can see that the membranes kind of burst in a sense, and they're no longer intact. That is because image C was 30 minutes worth of time in hypotonic and image G was 45. So this is not good. You don't want your cells to burst and too much time in hypotonic will do that. So 
10 to 25 minutes should be the maximum amount of time spent in hypotonic. So after we've gone through our hypotonic step, we move on to fixation. So now we've gotten our samples in, we've aliquoted them, we've grown them in the hypotonic to say, or swelled them in the hypotonic. Now we need to fix the cells. And again, fixation is just a method of preserving the blood or bone marrow cells for use in fish testing. The proper blood and bone marrow fixative is called carnoise fixative, and this is composed of three parts methanol and one part glacial acetic acid. You want to utilize multiple fixative steps to effectively remove red blood cell ghosts and basically a brown supernatin that is formed when the red blood cells are lysed with the fixative. So with that being said, the number of steps is typically one prefix step and then three full fixed steps. So the prefix step is crucial in blood and bone marrow harvesting. And this step is completed by adding one millifixative to the hypotonic solution and gently inverting it. You then centrifuge it to pellet the cells and remove the supernatant. Now, so that means you've spent your 10 to 25 minutes in hypo, you remove your conical tubes, and you immediately add one mil of fixative slowly to the tubes and mix it up, spin it down, and remove the supernatant. Now, this is a really important step because it really causes much cleaner pellets, kind of keeps the cells from shocking with a ton of fix added to them immediately. And it really does form really crisp fish probe signals. So after your prefix step is your three cycles of fixation. Um, and I say at least three cycles of fixation because when you're done with three cycles, if you're still seeing some red or brown kind of coloring to the pellets, you should then fix them one more time. So at least three cycles of fixation should occur, one with 10 mils of fixative and two with five mils of fixative. Um, basically after your prefix step and removing that supernatant, you add 10 mils of fixative, spin it down, remove the supernatant, and then two five mils of fixative, spinning those down and removing the supernatant to complete the fixation process. So we're gonna move on to dropping interface cells. And this is kind of a drawn image here that's kind of showing some cells and how far apart they should be uh, when dropping them. So with dropping interface cells, you can drop at the bench level and most labs choose to do this because there are no special environmental conditions that are required. Um, we know that dropping metaphases require certain humidities and temperatures to allow the metaphases to spread. Well, this is not necessary when dropping interface cells. You wanna be sure that when you're dropping these cells that you dilute the sample until it is slightly opaque. Basically at the end of your fixation cycles, your pellet should be spun down at this point and you remove the supernatant before dropping the pellet just till it's a, the fix is right above the pellet, leaving only the pellet and a little bit of fix left in the conical tube. And then using some fresh fixative, you're gonna dilute the pellet until it's just slightly opaque. Now this is something that takes some getting used to, and the more that you do it, the more you kind of understand what it should look like before you drop. Um, it's important to just have a phase microscope there so you can make sure that what you're dropping looks representative to this image here on the right. Um, that's because you wanna see about 50 cells per field of view, and dropping too many cells or too little cells can be pro problematic with fish testing. So too many cells can cause overlapping and hinder fish analysis. And then too little cells can result in not enough cells to analyze. So again, um, once you kind of get that dilution right, you should see kind of similarly the spreading of what you see in this image to the right and about 50 cells per field of view, no overlapping, and that's really important. Finally, when dropping interface cells, um, when you're looking at them, you want to ensure that they look transparent and flattened. And flat nuclei should appear light gray rather than dark gray or black on the phase contrast microscope. So now we're moving on to basically our optional step that some labs do and some labs don't. Um, because studies have shown that baking slides um, can be beneficial but is not necessary and that overbaking is problematic 
So I did want to include a slide about baking slides because I do see that most labs do it. And if you are going to bake slides, I want you to consider the following. Um, first is that overaging can cause dim probe signals or failed hybridization. Um, for fish, baking slides for long periods, which is longer than 10 to 20 minutes, at high temperatures may dry out the chromatin and result in poor or no hybridization. So with that being said, um, if you're gonna bake slides, do it for 10, five or 10 minutes at 90 to 95, as this has been shown to condense chromatin and condense scattered signals into more discrete signals. So it could be helpful if you're seeing scattered signals to bake it for five to 10 minutes at 90, 95. So the overall takeaway here is that baking isn't gonna harm fish unless you're doing it for too long and too hot. And that if you are going to do it, I recommend 90 to 95 degrees Celsius for five to 10 minutes or just don't bake it at all. Okay, so we've gotten through our pellet making process. We've dropped our slides. We've baked them if we want to. Now we're moving on to the actual fish part of the testing. And that starts with your denaturation and hybridization. So before denaturation and hybridization, you wanna dehydrate your slides in a series of ethanol washes. And you do so by placing the slides in 70%, 85%, and 100% ethanol for two minutes each, right before continuing with the fish process. You wanna be sure you're always using the rec recommended amount of probe to buffer ratio. And Empire Genomics does recommend using two microliters of probe with eight microliters of buffer for a total of 10 microliters per cellular area. Um, too much probe can result in background and unspecific signals. So um, if you're using proper protocol, I always say that you shouldn't have to use more probe or less probe to accommodate. Just use a proper protocol for setting up your cells and then the proper amount of buffer and probe. So after you've added your 10 microliters of probe and buffer to the cellular area, you wanna ensure that you cover slip it and seal it properly with rubber cement to keep the probe from drying out. Um, if the probe does dry out overnight or during your hybridization period, uh, it's gonna cause these really obscure fluorescent signals that are gonna make it really hard to see actual signal. And I will show you an image of that in our next slide. So after we've got probe on there, we've cover slipped it and we've properly sealed it with our rubber cement, we wanna denature at 73 for two minutes and then hybridize in a dark humid environment at 37 degrees Celsius for 16 to 24 hours. So the keywords here are dark and humid. Um, obviously, I hope you know, if you've watched my other webinars that dark or light exposure is not good for probe as a lot of dyes can be photosensitive and bleach in light. So keeping it in a dark environment is very important as well as humid, which cycles back to keeping the probe from drying out. So I have a few, why am I seeing this images that might help us understand what we're seeing if something goes wrong with our fish testing. And this first one here, you can see that there is little to no signal in the cells. And that's because the protocol utilized one microliter of probe and nine microliters of buffer. So that's far too dilute and not enough probe. And that is why we see little to no signal. In this second image, we can see that there's background within and outside of the cell. And that's indicative of utilizing four microliters of probe or too much probe in comparison to buffer. Um, again, the big takeaway here is that we use the recommended amount of probe, which is two microliters of probe and eight microliters of buffer. Um, if you use too little, you may not see signal. If you use too much, you're gonna get a lot of background. And finally, hopefully based on the last slide, you've learned that if the probe dries out, it causes some crazy fluorescence and can obscure your signals. Um, and that's a, this is an image of what that looks like. So after we have denatured and hybridized our slides, we're gonna move on to our wash process. And this is basically done to remove any unbound probe and debris from the slide. The first wash should be in a hot wash, which is 
XSSC for two minutes at 72 degrees Celsius. And the second wash should be a room temperature wash in 2XSSC for two minutes. Agitation is key. So you wanna be sure you're agitating the slide for approximately 15 seconds at the beginning of each wash cycle. And this is really gonna just help remove that excess probe and debris from the slide. Wash stringency is also important to pay attention to. If your wash is too stringent or too strong, signals can fade away. And if the stringency is too low or just not strong enough, probe and debris can be left on the slide and you can see fluorescent background when analyzing. And finally, you wanna be sure you're changing your wash solutions. So I see a lot of labs who do this very little and it causes a lot of background and issues with their analyzing. Um, depending on high, high, how high of a volume your lab is and how many slides you process throughout the week or even the day, um, you may need to change your solution more often. But it is important to know that probe and debris can contaminate your wash over time and the wash just becomes less useful, useful and kind of um, loses its, its stringency over time as well. So it's, it's good to change them regularly. So moving on to another, why am I seeing this? I have two images here, and based on the last slide, hopefully you've learned what this is indicative of. Um, the first slide, you see a lot of background within and outside of the cell. And then the second slide, you see little to no signal with absolutely no background anywhere else. And these are both wash issues. The first one is that the wash conditions were poor in the sense that maybe they didn't agitate well, the wash wasn't stringent enough to get rid of the background or not enough time was spent in the wash. It can also be indicative of an old wash solution that's just not effective anymore and needs to be changed. And to fix this, you can increase your time spent in wash, use a more stringent wash or agitate the slides well to remove excess probe. You can also make sure you're replacing your old wash solutions. The second image is indicative of a wash that may be too stringent or too much time is being spent in wash. And that is noted by the dim signals and lack of signal strength within the cells and no background. Um, and you can fix this by utilizing a less stringent wash or decrease your time spent in wash. So now we've hybridized, denatured hybridized, and we wash our slides, we need to counterstain and view them to analyze. And it's important to ensure that your DAPI contains antifade to avoid signal fading. Um, so again, dyes can be photosensitive and are susceptible to photo bleaching. So the more time they're spent to scope exposure or natural light can fade signals, adding antifade in your DAPI or ensuring your DAPI contains antifade will help prevent that. Um, now, antifade is not always 100%. So, you know, be sure you're trying to limit your scope time as much as possible with these slides when imaging. Um, you're closing your shutter in between taking images, and that's really going to help keep your probe signal strong for further viewing. You also want to ensure you're using the proper dilution of DAPI. Um, if the DAPI is too bright, it can drown out your signal, so that's important. After counter staining and cover slipping, you want to allow the slide to sit in the dark for 15 to 20 minutes before viewing under the scope. That's just going to allow the cells to really soak up that DAPI. And finally, the scope should be supplied with the proper fluorescent filters to yield the strongest signals from your probe. Each dye has its own kind of specifications and filters that align with it perfectly. So when you purchase probes, you wanna make sure that your filters are somewhat near those specifications. So moving on to a why am I seeing this, I have two images here that hopefully you can notice are very brightly dappied and so much so that the first image you can't see any signal the second one you can see a little bit but it's just almost the signals drown out and both images are utilizing DAPI in too high of a concentration so this DAPI needs to be diluted a bit and that way those signals really pop more 
So here I've included an Empire Genomics dye specification, specification sheet. Um, and this basically has all the specifications for the dyes that we use with our Empire Genomic probes. And it will allow you to look for filters that align with our dyes so that you can get the most adequate signal from our probes.